On June 27, 2011, the Supreme Court of the United States struck down a California law which sought to fine retailers up to $1,000 every time they sold a violent video game to someone under the age of 18. The state argued that exposing minors to depictions of violence in video games made those minors more likely to experience feelings of aggression, to experience a reduction of activity in the frontal lobes of the brain, and to exhibit violent, antisocial, or aggressive behavior. Even minors who do not commit acts of violence suffer psychological harm from prolonged exposure to violent video games. And yes, this only applies to minors. We're magically immune to such effects the minute we turn 18, apparently. Now, of course, not all violent video games are created equal. There's obviously a difference between the type and level of violence in, say, Halo and Manhunt. As such, not all violent video games would have fallen under the scope of the law, but which ones would have? Which games are so violent that they pose a danger to the children who play them? Well, According to the state, any game which enables the player to virtually inflict serious injury upon images of human beings or characters with substantially human characteristics in a manner which is especially heinous, cruel, or depraved in that it involves torture or serious physical abuse to the victim. And which games are those? Postal 2. That's it. Postal 2. Yes, the state of California spent six years fighting three court battles and spending well over a million taxpayer dollars, all to prevent the 17 and younger crowd from playing one game. Holy wiffle balls, Postal 2 must be the single most violent, immoral, antisocial, sociopathic celebration of debauchery and depravity the video game world has ever seen! Let's play it! Ho, ho, ho. This is going to be good. You know, Postal 2 wasn't even on my radar until California started making a fuss about it. <laughs> Wouldn't it be ironic if the government's continual and very public frantic efforts to restrict the sales of Postal 2 only made it more attractive to gamers under 18 and they played it specifically because the government told them not to? <laughs> Okay, Postal 2, what unimaginable deviance will you ask of me? I mean, if controversial games such as Grand Theft Auto, Hitman, Soldier of Fortune, God of War, Gears of War, and the like don't merit a sales restriction, then Postal 2's mission objectives must be something truly abhorrent and sadistic. Something like, soak a kitten in gasoline, light it up, and use it to firebomb an orphanage. Then feast. Feast on the charred remains of the dead children. <laughs> okay, here we go. The first level of the one game that required government intervention tasks you to pick up your paycheck, cash it, and get milk from the store. Well, let's talk a little bit about the law's background. In 2005, then-Assemblyman Leland Yee wrote Assembly Bill 1179, which sought to fine retailers up to $1,000 every time they sold Postal 2 to someone under 18. And yeah, I'm not kidding about Postal 2 being the only game. In 2010, during oral arguments before the Supreme Court, Justice Kagan said, I read your briefs all the way through, and the only thing that I found that you said was clearly covered by the statute was Postal 2. But presumably the statute applies to more than one video game, so what else does it apply to? How many video games? What kind of video games? How did the state answer that? It dodged the question. When pressed if Mortal Kombat would be prohibited, it said the video game industry should look at it, should take a long look at it. But I don't know off the top of my head. I'm willing to state right here in open court that the video game Postal 2 would be covered by this act. The state added that it was willing to guess that Mad World would be covered too. Willing to guess. So, yeah, while it ostensibly covered more than one game, Postal 2 was the only title California was able to confidently say would fall under the scope of the law. Oh, the law also required manufacturers to identify games covered by the act and label the ones sold in California with a 2x2 two two inch solid white 18 outlined in black. What would that look like? 
something like this. That big old You'd Better Be 18 sticker goes really nicely right next to the ESRB rating, which says recommended for ages 17 and up, don't you think? I don't know how the game industry was expected to figure out which games to put this sticker on when even the people pushing the law couldn't identify more than one title in the span of five years. Good thing the government didn't hold itself to the same standard, or it might have fined the state right into bankruptcy. And here we are. Apparently we work at Running With Scissors, the real-life developer of Postal 2. Cool. Anyway, AB 1179 was passed and signed into law by then-Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger in October of 2005. And the video game industry immediately sued, which resulted in a preliminary injunction preventing the law from going into effect at the end of that year. In August of 2007, District Court Judge Ronald White permanently enjoined the law, ruling it unconstitutional, and noting that the state showed no evidence that violent video games, as defined in the act, cause injury to children, or that video games are any more harmful than violent television, movies, internet sites, or other speech-related exposures. That's right. No evidence. But Leland Yee has a background in child psychology, so he didn't need evidence to justify writing the law. He just knew. Okay, Vince Desi, this looks like it. Hey, Vince. Nothing personal, man, but you're fired. Aw. But I just started yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you okay there, Vince? Your check is on my desk. Go get it. Okay. That's what we came here for anyway. And done. Huzzah! Okay, we're... cutscene. Games are bad, they make you mad. Games are bad, they make you mad. Games are bad, they make you Who's mad. Who's with me? Games are bad, they make you mad. Come on, Games everyone, bad, follow me. Oh, dear. Well, that escalated quickly. Uh, Vince, you might want to, uh, take cover. There's some crazy, irrational anti-gamers storming the cat. Vince, what are you doing? No, that's not the way! <laughs> oh. Oh, no. oh! Okay, I'm out of here. I'm open. Open! It oh, hi. Bye. Um, oh. Um. Is everybody okay? Ooh. Um. Well, not, nice job, guys. You, uh, you got them all. Well, almost. Okay, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. What was I talking about? Um, oh, yeah. Subsequent to the district court ruling, Governor Schwarzenegger ordered an appeal to the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court, and in February 2009, the three-judge panel issued a unanimous ruling which upheld the lower court's permanent injunction. So, Governor Schwarzenegger appealed to the Supreme Court, which took the case, heard oral arguments in November 2010, and on June 27, 2011, said the exact same thing every other court that's looked at such laws had said. No! You see, California's law was not unique. Similar laws have been tried about a dozen times over the last decade in various states, such as Illinois, Michigan, Minnesota, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, and every single one has failed. Every. Single. One. And yet, folks like Leland Yee keep trying. Maybe I should keep that. Do you know what the definition of insanity is? So, why do they fail? Well, video games are protected speech. Even California has no argument there. So, because the law imposed a content-based restriction on protected speech, it was always going to fail unless the state could demonstrate that it passed strict scrutiny. In other words, it had to be justified by a compelling government interest and narrowly drawn to serve that interest. Leland Yee, who is a state senator now, has argued, We narrowly tailored this law to serve the state's compelling interest in protecting children. Aw, didn't that sound nice? Well, unfortunately for him, you can't just say you have a compelling state interest to protect children from psychological harm and call it a day. You have to do three very important things. Show that there is actually psychological harm being done. Show that the law will effectively protect them from that harm. And show that it is the least restrictive means of doing so. 
Okay, so let's look at the first point. Did the state show that these ultra-violent video games are harmful for our children to play? No. And the Supreme Court wasn't shy about pointing that out, saying the state's evidence is not compelling. California relies primarily on the research of Dr. Craig Anderson and a few other research psychologists whose studies purport to show a connection between exposure to violent video games and harmful effects on children. These studies have been rejected by every court to consider them, and with good reason. They do not prove that violent video games cause minors to act aggressively, which would at least be a beginning. Instead, nearly all of the research is based on correlation, not evidence of causation, and most of the studies suffer from significant admitted flaws in methodology. And the opinion of every court to look at such laws reads the same way. There is no evidence that violent video games are harmful to anyone. None. If there were, you can bet your battle toads that Leland Yee and everyone else pushing such legislation would show it to the court. And here we are at the bank. Hmm. Uh, I'll just wait in line, I guess. Okay, so the state was stomping on the First Amendment to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Lovely. The second point required the state to show that preventing children from buying violent games would be an effective means of protecting them from the psychological harm caused by playing them. Okay, well, how often are kids buying games themselves? Well, when the law was written in 2005, a nationwide survey conducted for the Entertainment Software Association found that where children were concerned, parents were present for 92% of game sales and rentals. 92%. And that's just parents. Throw in sales made by aunts, uncles, grandparents, older siblings, older friends, and the hobo some kids slipped a fiver, and you're looking at a very small number of minors buying games. On top of that, not every game is violent. According to NPD Group, only 15% of the games sold in 2005 were rated M for Mature. That number's increased over the years as young gamers have aged into adulthood, but in 2010 it was still only 24%. In fact, for all the cries of how video games are becoming more and more violent, only 9% of the games released in 2012 were rated M. And let's not forget that retailers voluntarily restrict the sale of M-rated games to those under 17. How effective are those policies? A nationwide sting conducted by the Federal Trade Commission back in 2005 found that only 42% of minors aged 13 to 16 were able to successfully purchase an M-rated game. In 2010, that number dropped to 13%. So, the vast, vast, vast majority of the time, kids are not buying games. When they are, they're most likely purchasing age-appropriate titles. If they're under 17 and do try for an M-rated game, retailers are very good about refusing the sale. So the state's master plan to protect children from the psychological harm caused by playing violent video games was to impede the single, least common way that children gain access to video games, violent or otherwise. Would it have been effective? About as effective as trying to reduce deforestation by detoothing the world's beaver population. Hello. Hi there. Can anyone Jinx. help you? Okay, let's update your account. And hmm, there you go. Thanks. Yippee skippy. Mission accomplished with extreme prejudice. Yes, indeed. All right, so the third point with... Uh-oh, cutscene. Oh. <laughs> this is a stick-up! Don't move and you won't get hurt. Don't move and I won't get hurt? All right, not moving. Not moving at all. Just gonna stand here. Still not moving. How can I help you? What? Are you kidding? Uh, well, okay, um Can anyone help you? Oops. Yeah, oops. Well, officer, I think you have this under control. The third point was that the law had to be the least restrictive means to protect children from harm, and once again, fail. Why? 
Well, because even when Leland Yi introduced the law back in 2005, there were already less restrictive and more effective means in place to keep kids from playing violent video games. The game industry has been rating its games for content since 94, and retailers have long had voluntary policies in place restricting the sale of mature-rated video games to minors. And, it must be noted, retailers have done a far better job with video games than movies and music, and have only improved over the years. According to the Federal Trade Commission in a 2009 report to Congress, the video game industry outpaces the movie and music industries in the three key areas that the Commission has been studying for the past decade, restricting target marketing of mature rated products to children, clearly and prominently disclosing rating information, and restricting children's access to mature rated products at retail. And even if Junior did manage to purchase an M-rated game, every console since 2006 has had parental controls which Mom and Dad could enable to prevent such games from even playing. And Leland Yi says we simply cannot trust the industry to regulate itself. No, seriously, he said that in 07. And as is par for the course, the Supreme Court didn't agree with that either, saying this system does much to ensure that minors cannot purchase seriously violent games on their own, and that parents who care about the matter can readily evaluate the games their children bring home. Filling the remaining modest gap in concerned parents' control can hardly be a compelling state interest. Pwned. Oh, oh, let's have one more. Said Judge Consuelo Callahan of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, Under strict scrutiny, the state has not produced substantial evidence that supports the legislature's conclusion that violent video games cause psychological or neurological harm to minors. Even if it did, the act is not narrowly tailored to prevent that harm, and there remain less restrictive means of forwarding the state's purported interests, such as the improved ESRB rating system, enhanced educational campaigns, and parental controls. Boom. Headshot. Ah, oh, the store. Let's buy some milk. So how else did this unconstitutional and ineffective solution to a non-existent problem fail? Well, Postal 2 came out in 2003. In 2006, when this law was originally set to go into effect, you would have been seriously hard-pressed to find this game on store shelves. In 2010, forget about it. Oh, sure, you can purchase this game online, but the law only applied to sales conducted at physical retail locations. In other words, California, despite suffering some pretty hefty state budget issues, spent over 1.3 million taxpayer dollars arguing that it needed a law to prevent children from buying a game at retail that they couldn't have possibly bought at retail. It's enough to make you facepalm yourself into unconsciousness. But here's what's perhaps the most appalling part. When the Supreme Court struck down the law, Leland Yi said, As a result of their decision, Walmart and the video game industry will continue to make billions of dollars at the expense of our kids' mental health and safety of our community. A few days earlier, he had touted the law's importance, saying, We need to help empower parents with the ultimate decision over whether or not their children play in a world of violence and murder. In other words, it's totally cool for kids to play these harmful games, jeopardizing their mental health and the safety of our community, just so long as it's okay with mom and dad. As the Supreme Court put it, the California legislature is perfectly willing to leave this dangerous, mind-altering material in the hands of children so long as one parent or even an aunt or uncle says it's okay. And there are not even any requirements as to how this parental or avuncular relationship is to be verified. Apparently the child's or punitive parents, aunts, or uncles say so suffices. That is not how one addresses a serious social problem. Indeed. You know, I've always wondered why. If Leland Yi and his ilk really, truly believe that playing these games is harmful to children, why weren't they pushing legislation to make the allowance of such play a form of child endangerment or abuse? One might think they already know that violent games aren't harmful and that these laws are merely an empty and safe form of, for the children, political pandering. 
And so ends the first level of Postal 2, the only game in existence that is so far beyond the pale in its portrayal of wanton sadistic violence that California had no choice but to restrict its sales. You know, I'm getting the distinct sense that neither Leland E. nor anyone else in the California legislature actually played this game. Which would mean the people we elected to government office are writing laws without knowing what the hell they're talking about, and I find that a lot more disturbing than the idea of someone under 18 buying Postal 2 without his or her parents in tow. Well, may as well see what the next mission's objectives are. Confess your sins at church, collect signatures on a petition, return a library book, and get Gary Coleman's autograph.